Uh, okay, let me just share my screen and please tell me if you guys can see my screen. See. Right now, like the slideshow of the presentation. Yes. Okay, great. So I want to go with the presentation about it in a more, let's say, from start of how do we want to actually start developing an engine to somewhat an end and where do we want to look and go. I don't want to be exactly explicit about everything because it would take too much time and it would cover too many different topics. So I just wanted to go about the whole idea of that. So to start off, we need to have a starting point. And as I wrote here, we need first to choose a language. A good language to start and actually make it easy would be a Python or a JavaScript. They have a, well, pretty much big support of everything that we need, be it WebGL for uh, JavaScript or uh, whatever, most of the APIs, be it even OpenGL can, are supported in Python, so we can use Python and it's way easier for us to just start and figure out how the things work. Because the first thing is to actually understand the ideas behind graphics programming. Uh, because, well, everyone can Google a tutorial and make something work, but to actually make an engine or actually make a proper API for us, we need to understand the concepts. And to understand the concepts, it is be it's best to use the easiest language to actually test different things, test different ideas and understand how it exactly works instead of just scoping and paste pasting stuff. We need to also choose a target hardware and operating system. So, for example, we might have different low-level solutions for Linux, as well as different low-level solutions for Windows. And, well, it might be cool to implement for both platforms or even more, but to start off, it's better to just choose one operating system and implement just for that. <laughs> we need to also choose a specific API because the drivers will only allow us to run only one API at once. If you ever see a, an engine that has like two APIs or whatever number of APIs, it just at the start, they choose what API to use because they have implementations in different APIs. But at one time, we can only run one API and it's best to start with just one API and make it work to understand how exactly everything works. The best beginner friendly API is OpenGL. It's not commonly used right now because it's not as optimal and performant as Vulkan or DirectX, but it uh, teaches us the basics and actually the ideas of graphics programming that are necessary to actually make an engine work. Next thing would be to just use some working uh, frameworks APIs for the UI because implementing this from scratch will take too much time and we don't really need that. I personally prefer either Qt for C++ or Chromium Embedded Framework, in short, CAF, that allows us to write our UI for even C++ applications in JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, which looks pretty cool, has a lot of already great examples on the internet that we can just copy, slightly modify, and use, which is very good. And we have whole uh, communication between the JavaScript and the C++ might be very easy. The next thing would be to just cho choose some utility libraries like logging, something to play audios and so on and so forth. Whatever we need, we can just search up and use. And the last thing would be to just play with the already existing engine. So for example, it's very it's a very good idea to actually use Unity, use Unreal, create some small examples, some small projects and understand how they made some things work, for example, dividing something to levels, how they add new objects in the level, how they want to create, let's say, builds, and so on. Because, well, they already spent time figuring out the design for that, so we don't need to do that, actually. Okay. The next thing is the very base of everything, of how things are usually made in engines, and it's the Entity Component System, ECS. So let me give you an example of why is it useful. Okay, let me just start with what it is. So pretty much every object is treated as a component. So the object can have its own array of components, so different objects, and uh, every object has its own root. So for example, we can have one object in the scene that has 10 different components, and all of those components can be his child, he's the parent, 
but all of those childs can be parents of other components. It's, uh, it's like a binary tree that can go on and on. And the whole idea is that we only use specific, let's say, computations and solutions for only objects that need that. And the simple example would be if we have many models, uh, they are called meshes, but to simplify it, 3D models in the level, let's say we render some 3D models and let's say we have some clouds in the sky that are uh, actually models. We don't want to test the collisions for the clouds in most of the games, but we might want to test the collision for the, uh, let's say, tree, because the player can walk uh, to the tree, hit it, or just he cannot go past it. So like he can't go into the tree. So to do that, we need to test the collision for the tree, but we don't need to test the collision for the clouds. So to solve that, we can just create a collision component. And to those models that actually need to test for the collision, we can add the component. And for those who don't, we don't need to do that. The other uh, example would be to just create a player with a flashlight. We can add a mesh component, which is the 3D model, as the flashlight to the player. And we can also add a light component, which would be a spotlight that goes from the, let's say, point a certain point in our flashlight uh, to the vector directed outwards. So we can later turn on and off and have those two components as our flashlight in the player. So pretty much making everything as a component so that uh, is a very modular way to actually develop different solutions and make it pretty optimal because instead of testing for many different things, we just uh, run some let's say component update function for every component that we have. And that's pretty much it. So it's very useful and very simple to actually make uh, a certain, let's say implementations, optimize our projects and so on. Uh, do you guys get this idea? If not, I can try to explain it some more. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just keep it the start, so I don't know. Um, um, but anyway, uh, so are we talking about specific uh, type of the games, or are we talking about like general games? Uh, so we are talking about the architecture for a game engine, and mm -hmm. uh, here I'm talking about the commonly used, uh, let's say, solution for the architecture of, let's say, every single entity that will be placed in the level called mm -hmm. uh, entity component system where mm -hmm. pretty much uh, most of the com uh, implementations are divided into components so that uh, for whatever we need to do we can just specify it as a component so for example if you want to add a flashlight or a knife to a player we can just add a mesh component and set uh, it to a certain let's say mesh loaded from file if we want to add the light for the flashlight, we just have a light component we added as well. And we have one entity with, let's say, 10 different components, but every component has its own specific implementation. So it's pretty solid. And as well, we don't need to check for various stuff, but we have only what we need. And for example, when we have a collision component, we can add it only to the things that need to check for the collision and not to those who don't. This is a very basic example, but that's the idea. Yeah, yeah, I understand this. I, I, I just wondering because we have a lot of different game types. For example, this is a 2D games, platformer games, mm -hmm. 3D games, and so on and so on. So, and these types are, are important because if you're like trying to create the platformer, like in 90s, so this is one story. If you are, if we are talking about the rogue, rogue you like or something similar, this is a very different story. Uh, I'm asking because if I see the entity component system, I mean, this is something you may pick. Uh, is, is this your meaning or component? You mean something in a game which we may like, or this is a granularity system. So this is how we split the game into the small pieces. So we, we're talking about these components. Uh, no, no, no. So the first thing is I'm not talking about a specific game, but every game that you mentioned, uh, can be easily done with uh, a game engine that supports entity component system. And, enti and entity component system, just imagine that you create a base class called component that just handles a virtual function called update and begin. 
And imagine that uh, then we derive. I got it. I got it. You don't need to continue. Yeah, okay. I got the idea. Thank you. Okay, great. I, I have a lot of questions, so I will be <laughs> Sure, you no worries. <laughs> Ask straight up. I'd be happy to answer you. Okay, so like this is the basic idea of uh, running it as solid as we can and as optimal because we reduce the amounts of comp computations to the smallest number possible for each entity. Okay, so now going onwards, we have the rendering part. And when we talk about rendering, there are many different concepts, but I want to talk about the most basic one, which is a forward rendering against a deferred rendering approach. And to put it simple, first we want to choose a rendering approach that we want to use because implementing one of those two, which are the basic ones, might take too much time and too many ideas to implement. But the whole idea is in forward rendering, we render everything uh, amount of lights times amount of 3D models or 2D models. So amount of lights times models, let's say like this. And when I talk render and I talk, uh, I talk about a draw call. And a draw call is pretty much an invocation of our rendering pipeline. Rendering pipeline is pretty much calling uh, every single specified shader and doing some uh, specific calls for a given API that we've chosen. So you can just imagine that it's a, a kind of heavy operation depending on what do we exactly do because it depends on the specified shaders. Shaders are, are just uh, programs that run on our GPU and they specify, for example, the color that will be outputted to a pixel or the a position of, a, let's say, certain part of a model or a whole model. And for example, if we want to uh, render some realistic models, we really will use some uh, heavier shaders because they need to render some uh, real physical properties and it's just heavier for each pixel. But we can have some simple shaders that just, for example, output color and it's very simple and uh, very fast because it's, it's nothing much for a uh, GPU, but yeah. Uh, the idea is in forward rendering for each light, uh, we need to multiply the draw calls times each model because when we render a model, then we need to apply the color from each light to the model. And then we'll have uh, the pixel colors for this certain model. And we uh, do this again for every single other model. And so it's like N times uh, K, for example, as a uh, complexity. In deferred rendering, on the other hand, we first render every single property of our models. So for example, what's the color, what are the physical properties of them and so on into different textures. Every texture containing one property, it can be color, it can be how metallic they are, it can be uh, how, let's say, uh, heavy they are, it can be how reflective they are or emissive. And every single of those properties go into a single texture. And then using those textures, we do rendering uh, for every light. So instead of doing this uh, N times K, we're doing this N plus K. So uh, the only difference is we have a bigger memory bound because we have this N amount of textures that is equal to every property that we actually want to use. And then we just uh, using those properties, using those textures, we apply the uh, lights to the, let's say, textures that we already use. And the whole idea is if we have small amount of lights, we want to use the forest rendering. And if we have a bigger amount of lights, let's say more than five, more than 10, it depends. And usually you need to uh, just test for yourself where the performance starts to drop. You want to use the deferred rendering. Uh, the forward is faster in the small amount because uh, the memory usage where we need to actually uh, use the textures in the GPU and it needs to go through the uh, internals of the card itself. Uh, it's, it starts to get slow after a certain time. 
And for example, in the game Doom 2018, they went with the forward rendering approach because for their game with pretty, let's say, smaller amount of lights, it wasn't that small, but they just found some solutions, uh, tested, found some bottlenecks and implemented some algorithm to, space, to create a spatial grid of everything, pretty much. Uh, they figured out that forward rendering uh, will be faster for them because the uh, memory boundness uh, started to be actually visible. Because the idea is um, today, our CPUs and GPUs are so optimized that adding more draw calls is not the bottleneck. The bottleneck is actually going through everything in memory. And of course, some very heavy operations like ray tracing when we need to iterate over every single tray, do some collisions tests, and so on. But for the most cases, uh, our bottleneck lies in the memory when we need to move something from uh, point A to point B. And that's why the deferred rendering, ren rendering uh, starts to get switched to the forward one. Uh, and it's visible in some of the new games. Uh, but yeah, for starters and the easiest implementation and performance, it's best to start with deferred rendering because uh, having the least amount of draw calls uh, would be better when we don't have many crazy algorithms and solutions to optimize it out. Uh, do you guys understand the ideas? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so now... Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have a question about previous. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the game engine should define by its own when we should use forward rendering and when they're third. Am I right? Uh, usually, uh, game engine has a variable that you know, store somewhere to a config file, and you let the user choose what kind of rendering he wants to use. Okay, gotcha. Thanks. Yeah, because I mean, you can pretty much try to figure out what would be best, but it's a lot of unnecessary tests and implementations that you can just let your user uh, figure this out. For example, in Unreal and Unity, you just have like a enum where you choose what kind of rendering you want to use. And but yeah, good question, by the way. Okay, so now the next topic is what about the editor? So to make an editor that would be cool for like creating different games and actually be user-friendly, we want to actually check what works in our engine. So as I said previously, we want to just play with other engines and check how they make things work and how they make it so we actually understand what's where and what's going on. So just check the user experience and how they made it. The next thing would be to make it as flexible as possible. So it can be a dynamic input mapping where we can just choose what has to be mapped to what. Uh, some dynamic widget system. So for example, we can implement uh, some basic button widgets, test, text widgets, and so on. And then let the user, uh, if he wants to override it and create his own widgets to add it somewhere in the editor and do something with them so that it's easy to use, easy to change. And uh, after some time, we want to have some, let's say, runtime uh, editor uh, for the widgets. So for example, we can let the user uh, using some already uh, pre-compiled functions uh, define his own widgets and let's say create his own text widgets in the runtime where he doesn't need to know how to program. He can just connect some nodes. Uh, so like some basic node scripting. And uh, to make it work, we can just have some pre-compiled functions that later check uh, what is connected to what to actually use some uh, function pointers to go from point A to B. And this is the simplest solution. It's not the fastest. The fastest is to implement your own bytecode. It is what Unreal Engine does, but it takes a lot of time to figure this out correctly. So the easiest solutions is just to have uh, let's say node that has its own uh, function pointer to its implementation. And then depending on how the nodes are connected, 
we just call them in the order from start to finish. And maybe if they have parameters, we add the parameters as well to the function pointers. And that's like the idea behind that. And for the user where, um, of course, when you develop a game, not everyone is a programmer. There are game designers, artists, and so on and so forth. It is very helpful to actually have some scripting possibilities where you don't need to know much of programming, but you can actually make something and create some cool effects or a cool UI, like whatever it is. So do you guys get the idea of that? Well, kind of, but I have a question just to understand. Sure. Uh, for example, if we were talking about the Unreal Engine, uh, we can see that they use blueprints and it's quite important part of the engine. So here is a question. What is more important, the engine on its own or such editor you, um, that allow other people to use the engine faster without coding, for example? I mean, it really depends because uh, I think that both are really important, but I don't actually know right now what is more important because, for example, uh, if you take just the Unreal Engine, you have a lot of insane optimizations that, for example, in the Unreal Engine 5, you have Nanite and Lumen that allow you to create amazing looking scenes with their own uh, optimizations of textures, of checking what triangles exactly to draw, so dividing the data that you send to the draw calls and so on. Whereas, uh, you also have an amazing editor, but if you remove the engine part and create something very basic, then they have amazing editor, but can't create anything that looks actually very good. But if you remove the editor parts, then you just reduce the people to programmers that would after some time create some good editor, I guess. But uh, I think actually the engine part is the most important because the editor you can implement later, but the engine is harder and it takes more time from this point of view. But uh if you were to implement for example your own engine uh, then as i mentioned you can implement blueprints uh when you implement let's say a node class that has its own function pointer to some implementation and then just call it uh like a tree going from the start to the bottom of whatever implementation was called with function pointers this is the Easiest solution. It's not as fast as blueprints in Unreal, but it will work and it will be fine, I believe. At least it works in my case. <laughs> uh, okay, so if I understood you correctly, um, when the, someone decided to make its own game engine, he should uh, concentrate on the game engine and uh, um, implement editor as a second feature. Let's call it so, right? I think no, no, no. I think that the both as are as are are as important. Uh, but uh, if I were to look on it from the business perspective, uh, let's say you are not making this uh, as a, you are making this as a big company and you have a lot of resources. Then if you already have a very good working engine, then and no UI, then implementing the UI would be way easier than implementing the very good work, very well working engine, for example. Like from this perspective, but from perspective when you create an own, own engine to showcase so, something, learn or just uh, try to do something, then you need to focus on both because no one will want to use an engine without UI, but as at the same time, no one will want to use an engine that uh, has a very poor performance or cannot create anything that looks uh, subjectively good right okay gotcha thanks no worries okay so going forward there's also the idea to debug the problems because in rendering in the engine itself we'll have a lot of problems because we are just learning different concepts or just forgot to do something and the easiest solution on the market for let's say windows or linux debugging is a render doc, which is a free to use software that pretty much shows us what's going on on the GPU, what's in the certain draw call, what's in the shader values, and how uh, the certain models look in the draw call, as well as the errors of the APIs. And 
It even proposes sometimes solutions from time to time, but it happens. And the other thing is uh, we will actually need our own implementations. And by that, I mean the APIs provide some functions that allow us to check, let's say, status of a certain object. And well, we can create some API that wraps around it. And after we do something, we can just automatically uh, automatically call the check status function or whatnot. Uh, we can also, for example, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, use some logging library to make it easier and actually log to file or uh, create some UI pop-ups on warnings or errors that actually instantly give us strings in the runtime, for example, because there's a difference when we try to start our engine and it actually starts. But what if we have a working engine? And well, we had some errors during runtime when we tried to uh, copy some meshes on the level, but we don't know that because uh, we don't do any asserts because it would be very, very, very uh, irritating to have asserts during runtime because of some random error that shouldn't be really an error. Uh, then it's uh, best to actually have some pop-ups that tell us what happens. And so that we can just implement our own implementations and just check uh, without uh, having to restart our own solutions, but just test for more behaviors that might cause this, for example. So we want to avoid asserts in most cases when it happens to runtime and it's not super critical error because we don't want to actually get dropped uh, from the runtime because something happens. We want to have some pop-ups or something that's very user-friendly. And also we want to cache the errors because what if some user that is not a programmer finds an error or a bug. It's cool to have some caching system that can send this error to some uh, database or whatnot if we go for a more advanced approach. But this is like the basic idea of that. And do you guys understand it? I take it as a yes. <laughs> and I proceed further. So now, what about physics? I get it that we can have 2D physics, 3D physics, 4D physics, or uh, whatever like physics that we want. And the best solution right now is to use the NVIDIA physics, which is pretty much free. Uh, it has a lot of optimized implementations uh, for anything, really. And what we want to do is just wrap our own optimizations to that. So for example, uh, it's not a good idea to test a collision with, let's say we are a player and there's a tree, but the tree is like five kilometers somewhere south, let's say. And well, there's no reason to test the collision between a player and the tree or any other object that that's far. So the most basic idea is just to uh divide our let's say level into cubes it's called an oak tree to simplify it in 2d games in 2d implementations there's a thing called quad tree where we divide everything into a one quad and then divide the quad into four quads and then depending on the amount of objects we just make a variable some variable that's equal max amount of objects for quad let's say uh if the amount of objects that can test for collision uh, is more than the max amount of objects that we have as a variable, then we divide a certain quad into four more quads. So we can go more and more and more to create smaller and smaller quads. And the idea is that depending on the, let's say, collision radius, we only query the quads that are in the radius of our player. So we just go down the tree and use only the objects in the quads uh, that, let's say, overlap with our collision radius. And, well, it's pretty simple to test uh, if a sphere is within a ABB, or we can just, ABB, I mean, an axis-aligned uh, bounding box. So imagine this as a quad. Uh, it can also just be on a box for a player collision. So we test box against box if one is within the another. And if it is, we can t uh, either go deeper if there are more quads or use a certain quad if this is the lowest in the hierarchy and then test the collision with every object that is inside the quad so that we collision test with the 
a least amount of objects possible. And this is for the 2D game. For a 3D, instead of quad, we have a 3D cube. And everything is divided into uh, four, four 3D cubes, like one, two, three, four. They are placed on top of each other. Sorry, not four, but eight. And we have two sets of four, four here, four here. And then it's divided for more and more and more cubes. And that's like the very basic solution. There are also other solutions like uh, different collision channels so that we can add a, a variable, let's say an enum, that will tell uh, what kind of collision uh, is this collision for. So for example, uh, a collision that can only be tested for, with a player, let's say some trigger box that triggers some animation or text or event in the game. So there's no point to test its collision with, let's say, some flying bears or a tree, but only with a player. So player only checks if this type of collision is within the quad, and if it is, then we can go deeper and uh, test with it, actually. So this is like, those are like few ideas that are used in game engines and in games itself, and well, they work, they are optimal, and uh, yeah, that's like the base of it. Do you guys have any questions regarding that? Uh, well, it's not related explicitly to the physics, but I'm wondering, so we divide the, uh, our map into small cubes, and how exactly will we be able to define what kind of objects uh, contains in this area? So first, uh, you know uh, the object position. It's like a 2D vector. It's If it's cubes, then 3D vector, and you have the X, Y, Z. Uh, when you, for example, begin the simulation, uh, you can run some rebuild uh, oak tree method that, for example, rebuilds the oak tree for every static object. For a dynamic object, you need to dynamically rebuild the oak tree because you don't know if something moved or not. You can have some flags, but of course, depending on how many objects, it might be not useful to even use flags, but just update it uh, every certain amount of frames or every certain amount of time depending on the project. You can, of course, add variables to it if it's an engine and let the user decide when does he want to update it. But for the static objects, by static, I mean they don't move. You just uh, build the Oxy ones, and depending on their positions, like you can uh, create, knowing your work, okay. When you load meshes from a file or you create them, usually people create boxes that contain the meshes. And when every mesh is added to the level, they do, let's say, uh, they add the boxes up so that there's only one very big box that contains every mesh. And because of this very big box, you know the bounds of the level. And because you know the bounds of the level, you can create the bounds of the oak tree algorithm. So he knows where to start uh, dividing the uh, into the cubes. And because you know that, you can test on where exactly are certain uh, things that you want to test for a collision uh, proportionally for the cubes uh, in the whole binding box. And then just mathematically check uh, if they are uh, over, let's say, the margin. Let's say there you have the four upper boxes, there you have the four down boxes. If they are below, then you check in which of the down boxes they are, depending on their uh, Z and X, let's say, values. And then you, for example, know that this is in this box. And first you apply this to, uh, let's say, certain boxes, and then you can start dividing them or instantly start dividing them. Uh, no, actually not. After you go after the variable, which is the max amount of objects in the box, you start dividing the box. And for every object that was actually in the box, you test again for them to check in which uh, of the new boxes inside this previous box they should be. Do you get the idea? And then you go on with that for every object. Yeah, okay, I got you. So in effect, in effect it's kind of linear algorithm where we're checking objects one by one just to determine is it a part of the box or not. Yeah, this, okay. this is the thing. Of course, for dynamic objects, you need to do this more times, but usually you want to have as little dynamic objects that can test for collision as is possible. But yeah, that's the idea. So going forward, uh, how can we optimize the engine once the basics work? 
And here I have some very simple code sample where uh, it's used to group the entities. Entity, let's say it's anything that can be placed on the level. It can be a mesh, it can be some collision, it can be some audio, 3D audio point that can start playing audio. And well, here you can see that I have some array of levels and they have a variable whether or not the level should be updated. And by updated, I mean render the level, update the collision on the entities on the level, play audios, whatever it is that we have on the level. And the idea is, as I just mentioned regarding the collision, where we can divide the things into boxes, we can as well divide uh, our whole simulation into different levels. And depending on the player position as well, then instead of doing the 3D thing, we can do the 2D algorithm that I mentioned regarding the quads and check where the player is to actually load uh, levels that are close to him or just let the user decide which level he wants to load and unload. And we don't want to deallocate the things on the level because it might be too slow, but we just don't want to update them. We just do a continue and we don't do anything. It stays in the memory, we just don't update it. And the whole idea is to uh, don't check for collisions for the things that we don't care about even more. Don't play audios that we don't care about. Don't render the things that we don't care about. So just create a spatialist device, every single thing into as explicit arrays as we can and add as many algorithms to check which objects in the array wants to use as we can. Because once someone wants to create a big project, there has to be a lot of systems that actually uh, only update the things that we care about. Uh, there are, of course, many, many hacks in different games. There's a lot of talks about uh, Witcher 3, about Cyberpunk, about God of War. Like, they have a lot of different hacks, or even the Doom 2018. And it's all up to create as explicit arrays as possible to make it as fast as possible. And here's the idea of the levels. Uh, let's say we finished uh, some level and we moved on and we can teleport to this level back. And instead of adding a loading screen, you can just start updating him again. Of course, some caches might be broken and we might add to a loading screen depending on the level, but it's up to the user to test and add it himself. He'll have the implementations to do so. We just provide a system that uh, checks whether or not a level should be updated. And we just don't want to deallocate it because, well, as everyone probably knows, uh, memory allocations during the runtime are pretty slow. So we'll usually want to implement some uh, memory pool and allocate most of the memory that we want in the RAM and GPU at once, and later just use the memory from the pool instead of doing this at runtime. OK, so going forward, do you guys have any questions? I think it's a no. So going forward. We have callings. And what do I mean by calling? I mean that uh, when we have rendering, uh, as I mentioned previously, we want to render as small, as little objects as possible. So uh, we want to also uh, do this idea for the rendering. And it's not like as a big of a level, but let's say we are using right now the levels, we divide it into levels. We are only right now using the levels that are loaded and are close to the player and player should see. But how do we decrease the amount of draw calls? Well, uh, in graphics world, people uh, created this word called calling to actually uh, name any solution that reduces the amount of draw calls where we remove some meshes from a draw call so that we don't render it. The simplest idea would be a uh, distance calling. Distance calling is just testing for a view distance from our point of view to an object. If the object is farther than our view distance, we don't render it because it's too far. This is the simplest distance calling. We can also have a frustrum, frustum calling. And frustum calling is when we have our viewpoint, it creates a Frustum. So let's say, imagine that there's a very small quad that indicates uh, our near, let's say, view position and a very far and very big quad that indicates like a far view position. And everything that is not inside this frustum should not be 
draw cold because there's no point to do that. So we can just test mathematically if a certain object is inside of it, uh, positionally testing for it, let's say, because we know the position of the object, but it can be insanely big. It can be a mountain. And then what? Well, we need to add some hacks in the shaders to check for that, but this is, let's say, more advanced and I don't want to go through that, but you can just get the idea that we want to reduce the amount of drockles as much as possible. The other way would be to just test if a certain object is behind another object and we don't see it. Simple as that. It would be just, again, use shaders and check if we actually use the color from the object that is behind uh, that should be in a certain position, but we don't have any color from it. If we don't, that means it's behind something. We don't see it. Uh, we don't need to draw it. Simple as that. And this is like the idea. Do you guys have any questions? I take it as no, and I press it further. <laughs> so the next thing is, as I mentioned before about the explicit arrays, the data-driven programming. So we want to have explicit arrays. We want to minimize the V-table lookups and we want to be as cache-friendly and branch-predicting as possible. Uh, so the whole idea is we want to have, instead of one big array of entities, we want to have different arrays like meshes, audio players, collisions, whatnot, so forth, uh, that have their own non-virtual functions update, for example, where on each frame, we don't do a virtual table lookup for every single object, but we just uh, call the function because it's faster. And also it's cache friendly and branch predicting because if we iterate over, let's say only collisions, then the collisions that we care about will have a very similar uh, behavior. The same goes for audio players, the same goes for rendering. But if you would have a very big array of everything, it would be a disaster because you would need to have some switch or ifs or whatever, and it would have potentially different behavior each, let's say, iteration. It would be horrible. So we want to avoid this as much as possible. And yeah, that's the idea behind that. Do you guys get that? Yeah, kind of, but just to understand. So in effect, different kind of objects are located in different uh, in different arrays, right? So as you mentioned, like audio, uh, object on the map, uh, and so on. And they yeah. contain their own function as, for example, function pointers uh, to be handled during the update of, uh, the, of the game, right? We don't usually want to have function pointers on them. We just have to have a function, like a method. But what I mentioned is we don't have to have a virtual lookup. So uh, do you know the idea of a virtual keyword in C++, what it does exactly? Or because I can yeah, explain but, it easily. Yeah, I, I understand what do you mean. I'm just trying to understand, uh, well, uh, you cannot make one function for the all kind of audio. So how you can support the extending the of um, interface. OK, what I mean is. Imagine that you have an audio class and the audio class has an update function. When you iterate over every single audio object that you want to iterate over, you just call update on them. What I mean is you don't want to have one main type of object that has an update method and does a very specific update for anything. Uh, because then you would have a virtual lookup uh, and a lot of uncache friendliness in a way that you, you would then iterate over every single object, you would call the update, and you would have potentially different behavior each iteration. Whereas if you remove the vtable behavior, which after, let's say, thousands of objects starts to be visible in the performance, uh, it starts to be visible in terms of a uh, tenth of a millisecond even. You can have, uh, instead of that, just a direct method call without the vtable uh, lookup for the function pointer. You just instantly call it. And also because everything is cache friendly, so you don't do the tests on thousands of objects that can be different, but just on uh, groups of the same objects. Uh, we are using our hardware in, uh, optimizations and performance as much as we can. Do, do you get it? 
Yeah, I got it. Thanks. No worries. Okay. Any other questions? How does it work yeah, with, the, with the entity component system? With the entity component system? So when you have the entity component system, uh, you add a different array. So for example, you add an entity that's a collision, for example, then you add the collision to an explicit array of collisions, and then you iterate over this explicit array of collisions. Do you get what I'm saying? And you can yes. have some... Yes, but it means that those uh, components are static, right? You don't assign them at runtime. Am I correct? No, you can assign them at runtime. Uh, at but... runtime, add them to the specific arrays that you want to add them to. Okay. If it's a collision, then, uh, well, usually you have two states in editor. You have the editor state and the runtime state. So for example, in editor state, everything is static and you just move stuff, place it somewhere, uh, set some variables on that. And for example, you don't rebuild the ox tree. You don't rebuild uh, many algorithms. You just play stuff, uh, fool the arrays, allocate memories, whatnot. Uh, when you do to, when you go to the run state, then you start updating everything. Then you start running the algorithm and so on. But when you go to the run state, you usually in most engines don't modify the simulation itself you modify it in the editor state i don't know if you guys used unreal but for example you need to press a play button to actually uh play in the simulation test for collisions and so on so this uh, i don't know if this kind of helped you understand the idea or not but yeah any other questions yeah. Okay. Yeah, another question. Uh, so we can modify those arrays in runtime because we already pre allocate the memory pool. So in effect, we're just uh, rewriting the memory at the end of the array, right? That's why we can add. Uh, yeah, pretty the, much. Yeah, I mean, if there's a need, we can uh, allocate more memory to the memory pool and just uh, add more memory to the array. So yeah. Okay, gotcha. Thanks. So, in effect, uh, in game engine, the quite important part is avoids um, any kind of rewriting, replacing uh, as um, objects in memory. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. You just want to have as static things as possible and as explicit as possible, and as well as little things to update on as possible. Like, it's kind of obvious in most projects, but in engines, it matters the most because. People usually try to go for a, a best something. It depends. It can be some new machine learning idea. It can be some uh, best looking scene. It can be whatever. And to do that well, they need to have uh, everything optimized as much as possible so they can use as many milliseconds for their implementation as they can. So that we want to use our engine as little amount of milliseconds as possible per frame. So this is the idea. Okay, so any other questions? I guess it's no. Let's proceed. Okay, and now it's the idea about threading. Okay, but what about threading? The basic and naive approach in threading in game engine would be as follows. We'd have a render thread, some input thread, physics thread, AI thread, and maybe some audio thread. But well, there are problems. And the problem is, we will not be using the 100% out of a certain CPU. We would be using only six, five, maybe seven threads. And we would still have a lot of things to compute for each thread. And it would take time to, for example, load a project or load an engine or during the runtime to do something. It might be slow in certain cases. For example, if you have a very big scene, a very big simulation scene and a lot of models have different materials and by materials i mean some shaders uh, for example this is realistic uh, physically realistic model this one is translucent model uh, that is doing some crazy light refraction stuff this model is simple and just shows a color and this model uh, does some uh, ch change in uh, color depending on the distance to the player, for example. And the thing is, 
to load them and use them during the runtime or just to do something during runtime. So we are talking about the update of the oct tree for the dynamic objects or update of something for arrays. When we create during runtime more objects, we load some, let's say, AIs that want to chase the player in a certain cutscene or whatever. Well, uh, it would be cool to have some other threads to do that, right? Because, well, today's CPUs have lots of cores, 9, 12, even more. And usually we can have two times amount of threads equal to two times amount of cores. and still have a big performance boost. When you go over the two times amount of course, we can start to see some throttling because the threads start fighting uh, in the, let's say, OS threading manager over the uh, which one has to go now. But up to two times amount of course is fine. So we can do that. We can, for example, check at the when we start the engine, how many cores does the CPU have and allocate the threads equal to two times amount of cores. And this is how to solve the problem. The problem is a thread pool. And thread pool is just an array of threads <clears throat> uh, where we don't have a static threads like render, physics, input, and you're good to go. No, of course, you create the static threads, but then you add thread workers. So every single other thread is called a worker. And during the runtime, we assign jobs to the worker. And the jobs are some methods that we want to do. For example, compile different shaders. We might have thousands of different shaders, and it's normal. It's very normal, really, trust me. <laughs> I've been doing games, and in big projects, it's very normal that you have thousands of shaders that you need to compile on your CPU. And you just, for example, divide it into, I don't know, we have five free workers. You divide it by five and assign to each worker uh, 250 shaders to compile. Then during the runtime, you might have the oak tree to rebuild. Well, you can divide the oak tree and assign a certain part of oak tree to one worker, another to another worker. You might want to update some arrays and spawn some objects. Well, you have worker, assign it to them. They will do that for you. And you just need to make sure that your threading implementation in certain functions is protecting you from some random crashes or undefined behavior, which in C++ might be hard, but it's doable. And it well, helps you a lot in terms of performance because the workers do the stuff for you whenever you need them. And this is not only in game engines, like in many uh, applications, creating a thread pool with thread workers uh, tends to increase the performance if there's a need to increase the performance by a lot. So do you guys have any questions? Yeah, maybe I missed, but how we provide a memory save for multi threads or do we do you usually use mutex or is the idea is that per thread unique memory okay uh i don't know what you mean by memory because usually the operating system gives every thread its own stack memory and you still have the same ram memory that they can use if you mean like how to make it safe i usually use condition variable and uh, mutexes with different log guards, if it's me. Because the condition variables allow you to make a thread sleep. Wake it up and then do something so that they don't update. Because before that, people did some spin locks or whatever. And what spin locks did was just, if thread's not running, sleep five seconds. And it was on an infinite loop. And uh, now you can just make your thread sleep and uh, do nothing so that the core is not doing any computation. So you don't waste any energy on the uh, computer side. It might be important when you have some Android device, for example. So you draw less energy each frame. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's what I use. Conditional variables and uh, various types of loggers. Okay, gotcha. So it's quite hard to make thread pool in such a way that one thread working only with one specific RAM, right? Uh, because a thread pool means that we can use thread whenever it's free. That's why we need this kind of uh, safe mechanism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much. Okay. 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 Any other questions? I take it as no, so we can proceed.
So now, what about the animations? Shadows, crazy math, Fox, a path funding, and so on. So all of those things depend on the developer. They can choose what solution for shadows looks the best for them, as well as what path finding for the AI, both generation of the tiles for the AI, as well as the algorithm itself would be the best. Uh, in the engine, of course, because we usually want the engine to provide that. Uh, there are numerous papers, blogs, ideas in the internet, and if someone wants to implement such system, he can do so. And the idea is, well, as I've written here, it is up to you what you think is the best. The most usual pathfinding would be some optimized A star pathfinding, where we just have the tiles and check the costs. Of course, there are different uh, A stars, and we want to use uh, the ones that are that are looking the best, let's say, in the game, so that the AI does not look AI does not look like it's dump, but uh, it actually goes in a proper direction. The same goes for shadows. As I mentioned uh, at the start, going over shadows would require its own topic for a talk because it's a huge topic, and uh, well, if someone wants to start with it, he can just go to the um, any Google site where he Googles Vulkan uh, shadow mapping, OpenGL shadows or whatever, and just try to figure this out because it's just a huge topic regarding that. For the crazy math, there is crazy math, but only in the hard things that you do at the end to make something look realistically. Real, uh, make something look realistic. For the folks, the same. And for the other things, it goes in the same way. For the animations, animations are pretty simple. Imagine that you have a model, it's a player, and you want to move it. People usually add bones, and what a bone is, is just a location in the model. And we add weights to the bone so that knowing the weight, we calculate a radius from this position around the model, and uh, we just have this animation files that are generated by some Maya or whatever. And what they have is just pretty much uh, where to move a certain bone on a time uh, scale. So after one second, this, 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 blah, 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 that bone has to be moved this way. And knowing the weight of the bones, we know by some, let's say, standard in the industry uh, how what is the distance from the position uh, in the radius so that we know what triangles to pick. And then we just move the triangles that are near the bone. So for example, I want to move my hand, uh, then I just move this bone down and move like this. Boom, I want to move it up, boom. Because I have this bone position and this bone position, this just rotates, this just moves down like this. And this is like the very basic idea. And for the other things, it's a lot of different topics, but like I wanted to just show you guys the very, very basic ideas and what to think about it when creating a game engine or just a overly optimized C++ application. And do you guys have any questions? Because, well, that's pretty much it. And thank you. <laughs> and now for the questions, if there are any. Yes, we have in chat. Oh, okay. Sorry for that. Let me check. Uh, stop share. Uh, what are the advantages of writing a custom engine instead of using an existing one? Uh, so it depends. From the business perspective, you can have an optimized solution for your own project so that uh, for example, you want to have a 2D game, and the game is simple. Using an Unreal, you would have a very big chunk of a uh, file. Like, you would have hundreds of megabytes even for a very small game uh, that you need to use in the memory, as well as on the hard drive. And uh, you would have a lot of unnecessary checks. So let's say Un Unreal is built to uh lets the user create a lot of different stuff so you have a lot of different checks during the runtime for different things but if you do something very specific for projects you can re uh, run the project without the 
uh, let's say, additional computations that you usually do for a general purpose engine and just create it around your own project. And this way you can achieve very great looking animations. A very simple idea would be a game called Dead Cells or Hades. Hades? Hades? I don't know how to pronounce that, for, sorry for that, but they're very cool. They have very smooth animations and the whole secret behind that is because they created their own uh, applications, their own, own basic engines to the engines and well, uh, that's how they did it. And their advantage would be that uh, once you, it's more like for the developer advantage, but once you learn how the stuff works, once you're able to implement that, you learn a lot about computer science, you learn a lot about math, and you learn about a lot about the engines itself. So when you actually do something in Unreal, you actually know what's going on and how to optimize it, if you need to, of course. So it's a very big advantage in my opinion. And uh, the other thing would be uh, that if, let's say, uh, you are in a company and you guys have a very simple project and you want to use Unreal Engine, you can implement a very simple app for the project. And instead of later, if the company makes money, the company has to pay the Epic Games, it can just save them money. Like this, those are like the cases what I can think about. Is this a good explanation to you? Like Linus Torvald said, this is just for fun. So you may create your own engine just for fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly, also does. And also I have another answer to this question. So I work in any web uh, direction, so inside the browser. And actually we don't have a lot of different like engines. So we, we have a few of them, but because the browser is very simple, so create your own engine is also a very simple task. And this is because uh, this is why you may uh, just want to create your own. This is very interesting. Yep, pretty much. So guys, do you have any other questions? Guys and girls, sorry. <laughs> 